Today we're going to be talking about uh, colon cancer. Um, so we're going to do a, uh, we'll, we'll talk about a, a number of things. We'll talk about, uh, you know, what the demographics. These are things that I find that I get asked about all the time in the office. So it's demographics, the causes of colon cancer, risk factors, the treatment, uh, screening, and prevention. So those are all of the, uh, the, the big topics. So we'll just get right into the uh, epidemiology. You know, everyone born in the United States, most uh, you know, Western nations <clears throat> have a, uh, a lifetime risk of developing colon cancer of 4.6% now. And that's actually very good uh, because when I started uh, doing colon and rectal uh, uh, surgery uh, back in the uh, 90s, your lifetime risk was 6.2%. Uh, uh, so that risk has gone down considerably. So that's great. Uh, we find about 135,000 new cases uh, uh, present per year and about 57,000 people die um, in the United States from colon and rectal cancers. It's the second most uh, common cancer killer. And uh, it affects men and women about equally. So in New Jersey, in the United States and New Jersey, so if you look at all cancers, about 600,000 uh, uh, cancer deaths from all cancers in the United States. If you look at New Jersey, that, that breaks down to about 15 uh, thousand deaths from cancer. Um, and if you break it down into the uh, kind of the big four, uh, breast cancers, about 1,200 uh, deaths in New Jersey, uh, colorectal is 1,360, lung, uh, 2,930, and prostate, 700. Since this is a women's wellness, we need to look at how that affects women, okay? Because uh, colorectal cancer, like I said, affects men and women about equally. So if you break this down, so you say 1,400, uh, so that means about 700 uh, women are dying from uh, colorectal cancer. And roughly the same thing for lung cancer. Lung cancer is a slightly higher predilection in men. Um, but if you just figure, um, you know, half of this, so say 3,000, 1,500, it's still, uh, lung cancer is still the most common uh, cancer uh, cause of death in women, uh, but then breast cancer would be the second highest over colorectal because again you got to cut this in half. So um, and of course women don't get prostate cancer. So if you this this screen just kind of gives us a distribution of the cancers uh, nationwide by state. And New Jersey is um, it's a little higher on this. So uh, that's kind of 575 uh, uh, deaths per 100,000. So we're, we're on the higher end of the spectrum. So it's, that means more cancers in New Jersey um, than other states as opposed to uh, the dividing line is down here. So if you're below this line, then your state has fewer cancer deaths. So what causes uh, colorectal cancer? So, you know, it really is a genetic mutation. Um, and most of the mutations that we see lead to loss of control over DNA repair or growth or what we call differentiation, which is um, how the cells decide, uh, you know, which direction they're going to go in. Um, so all, all of these different types of genetic uh, functions uh, can be affected um, through environmental changes. Most of the colorectal cancer that we see are what we call acquired, okay? So it, it's not, you know, while the... Um, the mutations are genetic, you're not born with them, okay? So things uh, change uh, from a variety of different reasons. These are the way we eat, if we smoke, uh, all of those things uh, could um, uh, predispose us uh, to the mutations that lead to uh, colorectal cancer. Uh, so 95 
probably more like 96, 97% of all of the colorectal cancers are what we call acquired. Only a small percentage are actually genetically, uh, acquired, genetically programmed. So there are certain people who have um, the genetic makeup that predisposes them to colorectal cancer from birth. Um, those, pa those patients uh, have FAP, so that's familial adenomatous polyposis. That's a genetic mutation. Um, only one percent of the population, only one percent of those patients who uh, uh, present with colorectal cancer have that. And then HNPCC, which is hereditary non -polar, uh, polyposis colorectal cancer, and that's another two or three percent. So that only gives you four percent of all of the colorectal cancers um, that are genetically. Um, programs uh, for colorectal cancer from birth, okay? Um, so what are we talking about? Uh, and this is not going to be a whole genetics talk. I'm, this is just going over it because people ask this all the time. So, you know, you have normal, normal what we call mucosa, which is the skin inside the colon, and that goes to a small polyp, and it, from there, it continues on to uh, a large polyp, a polyp with cancer, and then uh, a colon cancer. And these are all of the genes that could be affected along the way or really have to be affected along the way in order to develop the uh, uh, colorectal cancer. So what are, what are our risk factors? So I like to break down the risk factors in terms of intrinsic risk factors, things that we can't really control versus extrinsic risk factors, which are things that we can control. So uh, the intrinsic risk factors include age. So the peak age for colorectal cancer is about age 70. Um, we, we can't control that. When we get to, you know, to 70, we, uh, you know, we're at risk. Uh, obviously, we're at risk earlier, but uh, the peak age is 70. Only about 5% of uh, colorectal cancers present below age 40. Uh, and that's changing a little bit, and we're going to discuss that in some detail. The other uh, intrinsic risk factor is your personal history. So if you have a personal history of colon cancer, then you're at higher risk to have a recurrence. Um, if you have a personal history of polyps, so if you had your colonoscopy and they removed a bunch of polyps that are uh, the precancerous type, um, then that could increase uh, your risk. If you have inflammatory bowel disease, which is Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, you're at increased risk uh, for developing colorectal cancer because that is by very nature inflammatory. And we'll, we'll kind of talk about that uh, a little bit later. The inflammation um, is what uh, uh, predisposes you to the uh, cancer. And if you have a significant family history of colorectal cancer, uh, that is also another intrinsic factor. We'll talk about that in some detail as well. Some of the extrinsic factors, these are things that we do to ourselves um, that we could actually um, prevent our um, obesity, diet. Um, you know, so, you know, we generally have a diet that is high in fat and low in fiber. We really want the opposite. Uh, physical activity or lack thereof. Um, excessive smoking, uh, alcohol, uh, and some medications that we take, uh, such as uh, aspirin, hormone replacement, and folate, that actually um, decreases our risk factor. We'll talk about that a little bit. So diet, um, specifically, we want a diet, or we really need a diet that's high in fiber and low in fat. So that means fresh fruits, fresh vegetables, whole grain cereals and breads. Those are all the things that we should be eating a lot of. And you also want to drink plenty of water. Um, so unfortunately, we don't do that. We have a diet that's uh, high fat, low fiber, and the bulk of us don't eat a lot of fresh fruits and fresh vegetables or whole grains. So I, I think, um, you know, I, I usually tell people that you, you know, the, the average uh, daily fiber intake should be about 25 to 35 grams of fiber a day. 
And I would say that most people get maybe about nine or 10 grams of fiber a day if they're trying. In terms of family history, so like I said in the beginning, everybody born, so your general risk is 4.6%. So you're born in the United States, you have a 4.6% chance of acquiring colorectal cancer in your lifetime. Now, if you have uh, a first degree relative, mother, father, sister, brother, who uh, acquires colorectal cancer, that increases your risk by two times. If you have two or more first degree relatives, that increases your risk by four times. And probably the, the most important one is if you have a cancer in a primary relative uh, that presents early, so generally under the age of 45. So, you know, even if they're 50, um, if they have a significant cancer with metastatic disease and all that, they, they probably uh, acquired that at a much, you know, uh, younger age, so 46, 47, because it does take time to grow. Um, you know, that is a pretty much what we call a red flag. I mean, that increases your risk by uh, over five times. So if you have a primary relative who is under the age of 50 or 45, you're at high risk uh, for developing colorectal cancer. And then, you know, if you have, like I said, if you have a personal um, history of familial adenomatous polyposis or FAP, you, you, you have a 100% chance of uh, getting colon cancer. So that has to be addressed. Fortunately, like I said, that, that's few and far between and the FAPCC, is, your, your risk is high. Um, what are the other risk factors? So if you have um, inflammatory bowel disease, so again, col uh, Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, particularly ulcerative colitis, greater than 10 years, your, your risk increased by 1.5 uh, times. Obesity, if your BMI is greater than 30, data shows us that uh, those people also have an increased relative risk of uh, developing colorectal cancer by one and a half times. Diabetes, red meat, tobacco use, as well as alcohol use, more than three drinks a day, um, all increase your um, relative risk by roughly one and a half uh, times. So all of these things increase and they're all additive. So if you have two or three of these things, you're uh, increasing your risk of colorectal cancer significantly. Some of the things that can decrease your risk. Um, so these are things that we can do to minimize um, our chance of getting colorectal cancer. We exercise 150 uh, minutes a week. Um, that'll decrease our risk by about 0.7 times. Again, the high fiber diet, 25 to 35 grams a day, which is a lot. Um, you can decrease your risk by 0.7 times. Uh, dairy and, and uh, milk consumption, uh, there's ongoing data that suggests uh, that that helps us decrease our risk, usually because we're increasing our calcium intake. Um, some of the other things that decrease uh, or potentially decrease our risk factors um, are the use of aspirin, folate, uh, again, calcium, and hormone replacement therapy. Now, generally speaking, we don't recommend for people to take aspirin to reduce your risk, but we do notice that people who take aspirin therapy for other reasons, maybe for their arthritis or what have you, have a lower risk of um, developing colorectal cancer. Same thing with folate and calcium and hormone replacement therapy. Obviously, we don't, we don't recommend hormone replacement surgery, uh, hormone replacement treatment um, as a means of decreasing your risk. But if you are um, undergoing a hormone replacement therapy, uh, then you get the side benefit of potentially reducing your risk. So what are the signs and symptoms? This is a, a, another popular question. So, you know, typically you could have blood in the stool. 
you can have bleeding because that's so you that rectal bleed you go to the bathroom and you actually see blood dripping into the bowl uh, you can have change in your bowel habits so it, it could be that you're regular all the time you go to the bathroom you know you can almost set your watch by it and you know suddenly that that's changing it so uh, you're more constipated or you you're noticing uh smaller caliber uh stools so those change in bowel habits could be a, a sign of uh, developing col colorectal cancer. When you get to the point of uh, having abdominal pain and weight loss, that, that's, those are pretty um, far gone uh, signs and symptoms. If, if you in fact have colorectal cancer, those are late symptoms. The most common sign and or symptom is none. So, most people feel absolutely fine. They don't have any bleeding. Uh, they, uh, you know, their bowel movements are fine. They say, doc, I, I have no problems. Why do I need say a colonoscopy? Well, because we want to, we want to find that uh, cancer early. And, um, you know, just to bring home the point, I've had patients who the only reason why they came in for a, a colonoscopy, let's say, is because their neighbor was recently diagnosed with colorectal cancer. And they said, you know what, I've been putting it off for so long and I figure I should, I should just have a colonoscopy. And they come in and they in fact have colon cancer. So you can feel fine, everything can be normal and you can be diagnosed with colon cancer. So, you know, you wanna, you wanna make that diagnosis early if it's gonna happen because it, uh, then you have the best chance for cure and colorectal cancer is totally curable. The treatment or the cure is surgery. So the surgery, uh, surgical resection of the tumor remains the only curative treatment. So you have to have surgery to be cured from your cancer. And it doesn't matter how you have the surgery. You could have a standard open um, resection. Uh, you could have laparoscopic surgery, robotic surgery. Here at uh, Old Bridge, we, and uh, as well as Bayshore, we do all of these. Um, and then um, what about chemotherapy? Chemotherapy, wh whether you get chemotherapy for colon and rectal cancer uh, depends on the stage of the disease. And we don't know what the stage of the disease is before the surgery. Um, typically, we find, you know, once, once we remove it and send it to the pathologist, they examine it under a microscope. And there, there are two things that are most important, the depth of penetration of the tumor and whether or not lymph nodes are positive. So we don't see, you know, we don't really see the um, lymph nodes necessarily on say a CAT scan or any of those things. So they may or may not be positive. Um, and the depth of penetration is also not something that we could really uh, ascertain prior to surgery. Notice I didn't say the size of the tumor. The size of the tumor doesn't matter. You could have a very large tumor and um, the lymph nodes could be negative and it could actually not penetrate the bowel wall very much and you may not need chemotherapy. And you could also have a very small tumor that goes straight through the bowel wall and um, have positive lymph nodes. So size, the size of the tumor actually doesn't matter. It's the depth of penetration and whether or not the lymph nodes are positive or not. So as I said, we, we rather prevent the cancer. So early detection is the key um, for both prevention as well as cure. So for that, we do screening. So there are only a few things we do screening for. I, I, you know, obviously it's a women's group, so everybody knows about um, mammography, hopefully everybody's getting their mammograms. Um, so that's a screening test for breast cancer. For colon cancer, we do screening, we do um, stool tests and we do colonoscopy. Um, so for we do screening for common cancers that are lethal, okay? They have to have a long preclinical phase. So that means that it can't just pop up and then the, the cancer goes very fast. So it's gotta be something that grows relatively slowly. Colon cancer grows relatively slowly. It has a preclinical phase of five to 10 years. And then the screening has to be safe and accurate 
Um, some of the issues in screening and compliance and costs and whether or not the, the, the screening tools we use are very sensitive and people have to have access to them. So sometimes things like colonoscopy, people may not have access to that. For colorectal cancer, we used to say everybody over the age of 50 needs it. We've moved that to the age of 45. And that's very important. So hopefully um, anybody who remembers uh, 50 now, remember 45. You should get your first colonoscopy at age 45. African Americans still get their first colonoscopy at 45 because they're at a slightly higher risk. If you have a significant family history, uh, um, and particularly if you have a, a, like I said, if you have a family member who uh, acquired their colorectal cancer under age 50, you should get your colonoscopy 10 years before the age of that person. So for instance, if your father had colorectal cancer at age 38, then you need to start your colonoscopy at age 28, okay? That's very, very important. Um, again, we, we, the, the goal is to identify it as soon as possible. Um, Another indication for screening, inflammatory bowel disease. Like I said, those patients are at uh, increased risk. And um, again, bringing this home for the, the women's group, uh, if you have a history of ovarian, endometrial, or breast cancer, uh, you should also have a colonoscopy. So if you, you know, and not necessarily wait till 45, because if you're diagnosed, say, with breast cancer, um, you're you have a slightly higher risk of colorectal cancer. So even if you're 35, you should probably uh, go ahead and get your colonoscopy. Some of these tools that we use, uh, the uh, FIT test, fecal immunoassay test, uh, we, a stool DNA test, and then a FIT DNA. I think many people are probably um, familiar with this because they advertise it on TV. Uh, which is the uh, Cologuard test. And um, the FIT test and the stool DNA, you get uh, once a year. And the Cologuard, uh, they recommend every three years if you're going to go that route. Um, the old test was the fecal occult blood test, which we, is no longer recommended. And then any of these that are positive. So if you get a FIT test or stool DNA or, or a Cologuard, if those are positive, they require a colonoscopy. Okay. So a fit, a fit test, fit and color guard are very similar. Um, basically, you get a, a package, you, you get a sample of the stool, um, you follow the directions, and you, and you mail it in. Same thing with the color guard study. Um, you, you get a stool sample, you take a specimen, and you mail it back. And you'll get the... Um, you'll get the results in the mail. I'm, like, I'm gonna skip that. Um, so those are your non-invasive tests. And then uh, the, the more uh, advanced test, pretty much the standard test is colonoscopy. Um, everybody should get a colonoscopy every 10 years, again, starting at age 45. Uh, for those people who can't get a colonoscopy for whatever reason, there's virtual colonoscopy, which is a kind of a reconstruction of a CAT scan, and that's done every five years. Um, sigmoidoscopy and double contrast barium enema uh, are really not, uh, not really recommended all that much. So uh, virtual CT, again, like I said, it's, a, it's an x-ray. So you go, you get a, you get a, a CT scan of the abdomen and pelvis, it's non-invasive. It still requires a prep, so you still have to drink a lot of stuff, clean out the colon uh, prior to uh, doing the study. Um, the benefit is you, you don't require any sedation. Uh, so this would be you getting your CAT scan, and then you'll get some pictures that look like this. They get regular CAT scan images, and then they do a 3D reconstruction, and they might see something like that. Again, if they do see something um, that their uh, concern might be a polyp, then you have to get a colonoscopy. 
um, just to understand what we're looking at here. So this is the colon and this is the small bowel. So we're, we're talking about, so this is typically also called intestine. So the small bowel is the intestine. This is the, the colon here and then the rectum comes down here. Um, so normal healthy colon, kind of, you know, little polyps or a cancer. Um, and then uh, again, on the, on the 3D reconstruction of the CAT scan, you might see something like this or something like that, uh, which would lead to uh, a colonoscopy. Who gets a virtual colonoscopy? There are a number of reasons, uh, you know, more, most, um, I would say probably most commonly people with failed or incomplete colonoscopy for, a, for whatever reason you can't get through. They're high risk for a colonoscopy. Maybe they have significant cardiac disease and can't undergo the sedation. Um, the um, colonoscopy is still the, the gold standard because when we do see those polyps, we can remove it. So when we remove a, you know, a, uh, even a small polyp, we are potentially preventing a colon cancer. Hopefully in the future, we'll, we'll have something that's a capsule colonoscopy. You swallow a pill, it takes a bunch of pictures, and then uh, it get, it'll give you a similar uh, type of picture that the uh, CAT scan uh, gave you. Uh, but that's not here yet, So, but that's something to look forward to. So overall, there's good news, and there is some bad news. Um, the good news is that... Um, the incidence and prevalence and, and death rates of colorectal cancer have significantly declined over the past uh, 10 or 20 years. It's uh, you know pretty remarkable. Um, so if you look at these graphs, this goes from 1990 to 2014, and they, they continue to go down. But this is the incidence in men and women. I mean, that's a fairly significant drop, as well as the uh, death rate very uh, significant uh, drop in, uh, in uh, both incidence and death rates uh, over the last 20 years or so. Um, and if you break it down into, uh, you know, risk groups, um, here's where we see a problem. So if you look at uh, age 50 to 60, um, you see a you know, a reasonable drop. You look at age 65 and over, you see a fairly significant drop. Unfortunately, if you look at age 20 to 49, so everybody below age 50, you see that the slow rise in uh, uh, prevalence, which means the number of new cancer uh, uh, diagnoses and death rate. And if you break that up, you know, a little bit uh, more specifically, this is what it looks like. So this, you know, under age 50, colorectal cancer is on the rise. Above age 50, it's on the decline. And obviously, above age 50 is when we were starting uh, screening. So I think our screening colonoscopy, removing polyps, uh, you know, early on has made a dramatic impact in uh, the incidence and, and death from uh, colorectal cancer. Um, and now we're starting to see this. And we don't quite understand why it's increasing in, in, the, in that young uh, patient population, uh, but it is a, um, it is a, a definite uh, factor. What is going on with these younger patients? Again, I said we don't really know, so there are a number of uh, theories. So the, the prevailing theory now is this lack of biodiversity. Obviously, the easy thing to do is say, which we did, um, it's the diet and kids are eating too much, uh, um, fast food and McDonald's and et cetera and so forth. So that, that was kind of an easy thing to tag. And that, that probably is not it. Uh, obviously it's going to be something multifactorial. It's not going to be a one thing in, in any event, I was uh, saying that if you take this, uh, mouse model and high fiber, low fiber, you, you feed them both, and then you uh, introduce um, bacteria that causes inflammation. Um, and you look uh, and inflammation specifically in the gut. Uh, the mice that have the high fiber diet 
do very well. And the mice that do not, um, they pretty much, uh, they have a significant uh, uh, toxicity to the uh, bacteria. Um, so that's what we call, uh, that's the basis of the uh, biodiversity or, or the um, uh, microbiome. Um, so the, the take home message is in terms of the younger patients, we're not entirely sure what's going on. We, we have said that the microbiome or, or the, the health of the colon, um, plays a significant role. One of the functions of the colon is to make it, the colon makes a, a layer of mucus. So this would be the layer of mucus in the colon. So these would be the colon cells. This would be the layer of mucus. That keeps all of the bacteria and other toxins away from the actual cells. When we don't uh, have a diet rich in uh, fiber, um, then you can have this situation where the toxins can actually attack the cells. Um, so that's where the current thinking is in terms of seeing more of the young patients. And I, again, I don't think it's gonna be any one issue. I think it's gonna be multifactorial, but for now we don't, we don't have a single reason, but this is uh, one of the uh, uh, ongoing theories. Of course, uh, you know, that promotes inflammation. So the next question, obviously, you would ask is what about the role of probiotics um, in cancer prevention? And probiotics are, are absolutely fine because they, um, it even here says the development of colon cancer is unclear, but the gut microbiome contributes to colon cancer through initiation of inflammation. So you can do probiotics, which will be uh, populate your colon with the healthy bacteria, you still got to do the fresh fruits, fresh vegetables, whole grain cereals and breads and all that to, to make sure you have a healthy uh, uh, colon. Um, let's skip this. We're, we kind of lost a little time there. A um, couple of things to remember. Uh, colorectal cancer is the second leading uh, cause of cancer death among men and women, um, and maybe the third uh, leading among just women. Okay, um, you can, there are, there are places you can go, you can go online to find a colo, colorectal cancer risk profiler. And most of those will look at your age, gender, height, weight, ethnicity, whether you smoke, whether you exercise, all of the things that we talked about in the beginning of the talk will go into these profilers and it'll, it'll help you determine your risk of developing colorectal cancer. So um, for those people who uh, are younger or um, moms and dad who are concerned about their, uh, their children uh, developing uh, colorectal cancer, there's a website called uh, Never Too Young for colorectal cancer. Um, particularly if you are, um, if you have a loved one who's uh, a younger individual who has uh, already been diagnosed, um, then uh, you may want to go there. It has a lot of uh, resources. All right. Thank you.